Our next speaker is Gabriel Volp, and this talk is called Nix at Chat Roulette V2. So this talk is going to interest people who would like to make their job and the lives of people at the workplace better using Nix. And they'd also like to convince their employer and colleagues that using Nix is a good idea. So Gabriel is going to be going through their experience on how they did exactly this working at Chat Roulette. And just some factoids about Gabriel is that they are a really highly like active contributor to open source. Their um, GitHub handle is at gvolp with a total of 2.4k commits. And they're an author of a book, actually. They're the author of Practical FP and Scala, A Hands-On Approach. And as you've probably already told, Gabriel is a software engineer and is employed at Chat Roulette currently. Okay, you can take it away, Gabriel. Paul, oh, thank you very much for the nice introduction. And yeah, like it is a pity that you cannot see my face, but yeah, I think that it's probably better for you. <laughs> um, so the talk today, it's going to be uh, about two major topics. The first one is going to be about how we introduce Nix at work and, and what what, what, what were the necessities that we had and how we currently use it. And the second part of the talk would be more focused on the Scala ecosystem, which is a Scala, for those who don't know, is a JVM language. It's kind of like a hybrid uh, functional programming language. So two major topics for, for this talk. Um, probably uh, all the experienced Nixers are not going to learn too much from this. The the, the the targeted audience for this uh, talk, it's mainly every company out there uh, writing software or making software, actually. Um, so the, ideally, they will be using Nix, or I can actually uh, persuade them to, to to give it a chance and, and see how, how it can help. Um, so a little bit about my, myself, like even though I was already introduced pretty much uh, very well, uh, I currently work at Chat Roulette. Um, we mainly write Scala, but uh, I consider myself a functional programmer. Uh, I wrote this book called uh, Practical FP in Scala, and I love Nix. That's why I'm here talking to you today. Um, so uh, my Twitter handle and GitHub handle are going to be there uh, in the slides for the rest of the talk. So feel free to ping me there. And I'm also on the Discord chat uh, for the rest of the conference. <clears throat> so how we introduce it at work and how we currently use it. Um, it all started because you know, we had uh, some kind of like messy situation. Uh, I joined the company early this year and it, it all starts it, it starts with a basic need. basically. We have a mono repository with uh, the whole the whole project that it, it makes chaplet life. And the backend, as I mentioned before, it's mainly written in Scala, which is a Shavium language. And we use Docker and Docker Compose to run um, a few dependencies like Postgres and Apache Pulsar, which is <clears throat> at the core of what we do. We had uh, TypeScript, TypeScript mainly in the front end, which I guess it runs with Node.js on NPM. I'm not very familiar with that part. I only use it sometimes. Um, and the whole infrastructure uh, tools and, and software that we run mainly on Kubernetes, on a, on a Istio service mesh and so on. And we have a bunch of people uh, writing code using different platforms, like mainly Linux and Mac OS, uh, luckily not Windows. <clears throat> and yeah, so like first day I joined the company and, and you know, I spent it like all day uh, on different meetings and talks because I joined remotely and and trying to figure out what was all the software needed to to actually run the project and, and all the dependencies needed for the front end for the back end and and it also there's also a mix of for uh, of software needed whenever you need to to run the cluster as it runs in production like if you need Kubernetes and the service mesh and all that stuff it's it there is a lot of stuff to take in and you know um, like I think this was also my experience in previous companies not using Nix, that you know, pretty much everybody expects you to 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 figure out all the software that you need to run this, the the project locally and to to be productive. 
Um, so that's what I found at the beginning. And the idea was, OK, <laughs> this is a very good use for Nix. At least let's manage the dependencies that we need to uh, to uh, to run the project uh, locally, uh, both for the back end and the front end, and whenever we need it for infrastructure. And let's see how it goes from there. Um, um, so I introduced the first shell.nix with a bunch of dependencies that we needed and make it work for both Darwin and Linux. And like nowadays, we have something like this. Uh, this is just a minimal uh, example. Uh, it is a little bit much bigger what we have. We have a few other modules. Uh, we have some custom derivations that we had to build specifically for our needs. Um, but the, the advantage was like very clear to everybody in the team. So in order to introduce it, I only gave a small talk, uh, share my screen, and, and show people what is Nix and how it works and what are its benefits. And so everybody was pretty much sold out on, on, on using Nix. Um, I think it's easier when you introduce it to a group of functional programmers who uh, actually value uh, immutability and reproducibility. Um, but still, everybody was new to, to Nix and it's still accepted as part of the, you know, just give it a try. So this is what we have nowadays. And this is uh, very, it has been very good for the rest of the team and, and for everyone specifically because uh, a new developer showing in the team uh, only needs to do a few things on day one. Um, the, the only requirements are you need to have Git installed, Nix, and Docker, um, because you know Docker needs to run as a daemon with some other permissions. So we cannot provide it in our Nix shell. But other than that, um, this is all, all they need to do. Like now on the first box, Basically, git clone the project, enter a Nix shell, and we have a, a shell script which actually it starts the whole project if you want to run it locally. Um, and so that's all they need to do. And we actually encourage uh, our team to, to use DRAMF. Um, so you know, for those who don't know DRAMF, it basically um, enter a directory and all the dependencies declared in your shell Nix will be automatically available for you if you run these commands in the second box. Um, so we leave this optional in the company. We don't force anyone to use uh, DRAM because it it, is, it takes another few extra X steps to, to set it up at first. Uh, but we, we encourage pretty much everyone to, to use it because it's, you know, like you don't need to remember to run next shell to then run the other commands. And sometimes, you know, oh, where, where is my the build tool commands is not available to me. And it's like, oh, did you run Nix shell or not? So we we avoid kind of like um, remembering whether <laughs> a user is in a Nix, is in within a Nix shell or not. So the benefits have been huge. Like now we have reproducible development environments for both Mac users and Linux users. And, and, and everybody runs the same version, the same exact version of the dependencies. Uh, there is very, very little maintenance. Uh, we update dependencies from time to time whenever the, the need arises. But you know, everybody learned how to uh, update dependencies, how to, how to update the hash of the Nix packages version, because we have uh, uh, the Nix packages pinned to exact version. And like, yeah, even, even people got familiar with uh, you know with the SHA, SHA 256, the hash. Um, that whenever we, we update some custom derivations, they also need to update the hash. And, and that's pretty much what everybody does. Um, so for for very little investment, the, the 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 outcomes and the benefits have been huge for us. And so I would definitely recommend uh, development shells. I think it's the the killer feature of Nix. Uh, just, you know, you can do a lot of things with Nix, but I think this is the killer, the best seller feature for Nix. And I think everybody out there could be uh, leveraging this. Um, so definitely recommend it. Another use case we have, it's um, since we we compile our microservices using, uh, we, they're all written in Scala. So the, the output is the shard that uh, it needs to be run by, by Java. So it has a Java dependency. And we generate the Docker images um, using uh, the base Docker images to build upon. 
um, using Nix as well. Here on the left, you can find this is the Docker Nix file. It's very, um, very small. Um, but what we have, it is a guarantee that the Java version we declare in our Nix file, it's the same one that runs in production. And I mentioned this because uh, I've been writing uh, code on the JVM for about 10 years. And it is a very common problem. And it happens a few times that many developers, they just run different Java versions, whatever it comes installed with their system. And, and even if it's the same major version, you could have some issues with different minor versions. And it happened to me a couple of times in the past when a different a different version was running in, in production and we had some runtime issues. Uh, and that's because we compile it with one version, but then it runs with a different version, if, even if it's only a change in the minor version. So um, with guaranteeing that the Java version you use to compile it and, 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 and write code locally, um, we can guarantee that that's the same exact version that runs in production by creating this Docker image uh, using Nix. So this is another benefit. So there's no more discrepancies um, with the, um, the Java versions that run in production in your local machine. Uh, we have a few other projects that also require some extra packages. Uh, for example, Tesseract, which is a C, C++ uh, library for doing OCR. Um, so that's why we have this extra flag. But that's pretty much what we use it. Um, uh, since we also have the, the shell.nix with all the dependencies also for deployment, we actually use that in our CI build, like most mainly just running nix shell and any command. Um, we use GitLab runners. Uh, our, our repository is hosted on GitLab. Um, so um, this, is, this is all we have in, in our production code at the moment. Um, but taking in consideration that it started only a few months ago, uh, I think we've made uh, very good progress. And we're still delivering business features uh, that are always uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the, mo the ones with the most priority. Um, so that's the, the first part. And uh, I think I want to I want to encourage everyone um, out there not using Nix yet to give it a try, at least for development shells. Uh, I think that is a killer feature that you have reproducible development environments and and you can actually hire new people and newcomers will be creating pull requests on day one uh, without actually wasting time on figuring out what kind of dependencies they need in order to run your project. I think that is already, already a killer feature. Um, we also have a few open source projects uh, that we maintain. They are hosted on Git, GitHub instead. Um, I mentioned before that we, we use uh, Apache Pulsar. It's a um, distributed message broker. And we maintain two libraries, one uh, for Scala, one for Haskell. And we use Nix also in both projects. Um, but today, I'm going to be focusing on, focusing on Neutron, which is the Scala version, the Scala client, uh, because I want to continue talking about uh, uh, the, Scala, the Scala community and Nix. Um, so whenever people start using uh, Scala and, and whenever people start trying to use Nix in a Scala project, um, they will do something like this, for example, like pinning the Nix packages to a specific version. It's just creating a shell with the Java development kit, a specific version, the JDK 11 in this case, and SBT, which is the Scala build tool. It's one of the, the standard yeah, it's the most standard build tool in, in Scala. And um, yeah, so that, that's that's how people might start and actually how I started when I, when I was learning Nix. And, and then we, we run SBT and we get a message like this and say, hold on, uh, why is it Java 1.8 in there when I am actually, I, I actually want the Shady K11. Um, so this is, this always comes as a surprise for um, for everyone. Uh, I know it was a surprise to, to me as well, but it actually makes sense if you think about it. Uh, SBT uh, gets packaged in, in Nix packages, and, and it needs to be packaged with all its dependencies. And SBT depends on the Java version. 
So in order to build a reproducible SBT binary, we need to know what, what is the version of Shava. So there is a default version in Nix packages. In this case, it's Shava 1.8. But overriding the default version is very easy. You do something like this, uh, basically uh, SBT override with a specific Shava version. So we have something like this at the moment. Uh, basically, we parameterize over the Shava version, and we override the SPT version, and, and then we have a shell.nix, which has uh, also an argument for the Shava version, and we have a default argument. It, it defaults to um, to shadyk11, but it could be overridden if we just pass it as an argument. Um, so next time user run SPT, then we are welcome with SVT with a specific Java version that we want to run, and and, and that's it, right? Um, um, so that's one thing. Um, we also use in on uh, use uh, Nix in this project on on GitHub Actions. The benefits are, again, that we use uh, we can use the same Java version we use for local development in the CI build, and we can actually parameterize. Um, since we have parameterized our shell nix so by taking a Java version, we can compile and run the test for our project with multiple Java versions. So this on GitHub Actions will run three three different shops in parallel for the different Java versions here. In this case, eight, eleven, and fourteen. And if you pay attention to the last command, which is a nix shell at the end, it actually invokes a nix slash ci dot nix. That is basically the same as uh, shell.nix, except it only has uh, SPT as a dependency because we don't need more in the CI. And when it runs, it runs three parallel shops like this. Um, well, we, we run uh, Apache Pulse are using Docker Compose, which is exactly what we do locally as well. And then the rest runs using Nix. Um, so I think this one is a, it's a very cool uh, use case. Uh, unfortunately, we, are, we cannot use it at work because we use GitLab and GitLab runners. Uh, but I, I really love GitHub Actions as well. So we use it for our open source projects. <clears throat> um, we use Kachix as well. I, I, you might have seen it there in the in the GitHub Actions declaration. Um, and the thing is, like, we create, we override the version of uh, Java for SPT um, for multiple Java versions. So, and and if you have a file like this, an SPT.nix that we have. Um, if we have uh, we override it with three different Java versions, then this will create three different SPT binaries that contain they are different hashes, and we can actually cache the, these binaries to to pull them uh, from the binary cache on the CI build as well as on different machines. So developers don't have to build it again. And thanks to Domen for creating cachex actually free for open source projects. So it's 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 awesome. Um, so that's what we do, and don't have to build SPT and improves the CI build times. Um, so that's pretty much uh, showing a little bit of the the, the neutron project that we run. Um, but I want to talk a little bit uh, about how Nix is perceived in the Scala ecosystem, and how many users are using Nix, and and yeah, what is the current status? Because uh, JVM languages in general, uh, not very. They, they don't get along very well with Nix, and, and and there's a reason why. I guess the JVM ecosystem is huge. Uh, there is another talk uh, by the end of the day by Farid about the Java and Nix, uh, which I'm looking forward to hear. But recently, I ran uh, this Twitter poll, uh, um, now just focusing on the on the Scala community and. Asking asking the users, uh, the, the Scala people, whether they use Nix in their Scala projects, and 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 the results speak for them, themselves, right? There's more than 300 votes. Most of the people don't use it, and a, a high number of people don't actually know what Nix is. Um, so yeah, the the results are a little bit sad, but I actually want to change this, and uh, I'm I'm trying to create more awareness of Nix in in the Scala community, which is where I believe I have uh, a bigger voice. Uh, and 
there are actually a few, there were a few attempts to Nixify Scala projects using SVT. And these two projects, SVT to Nix and SVTX, uh, which are really ambitious. They try to create kind of like a file lock uh, with all the dependencies, uh, but it's actually very complicated. Uh, SVT is actually very complicated, the whole Shea VM. Uh, it's complicated and Scala makes it even more complicated. Um, so unfortunately, both projects seem to be abandoned today. Um, and and actually, I, I gave them a try a while ago, and and it's hard to get them working. They they seem to work uh, on small projects, but whenever you have a complicated setup, which is most of the case, most of the time the case for Scala projects, then they fail to build, and it's you know there's there's they are not being active uh, actively. Hi Gabriel, developed. just one so, moment. Yep. I just want to mention that you are actually in your Q and A time, just so you can know that. Sorry. Oh, it's just like the the, the talk ended. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. Since we have extra time, we can allocate an extra five minutes to that if it's okay with you. Um. Yeah. Like I actually didn't get any notification for that. Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't following it's in the, the, chat. the chat. Okay. Yeah. I saw it now. Um. So. Uh, okay. Proceed. Uh. Do you have two more minutes to finish the talk? Then. No. Sorry. So um, you basically, um, the five minutes you can take for now, since we have an extra five minutes to the Q&A, because of the uh, other talk got canceled. Uh, OK, sorry, I didn't see the message. Uh, I wish I could okay, finish. So you I have five minutes now. I was nearly at the end. <laughs> All right. Um. You can continue your talk, actually. I um, hope you understood that. Um, you can actually continue. We have oh, I can continue. OK, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so OK, trying to finish it quickly. There is uh, another project that I came across recently by Francesco Sanini. It's called SVT Derivation. And it is not so ambitious. It only creates a dependency, um, a hash, like two derivations, one for the whole tree of dependencies and another the derivation for the project itself. And it seems to work pretty nicely. There are a few areas where it could be improved, uh, like actually leveraging uh, cache and stuff. But it actually works, and it's actively maintained at the moment. And because of this, the Twitter results, the, the Twitter poll results, <clears throat> I wanted to create more awareness of Next in the Scala community. So I started creating this guide, uh, which is also a Shea template. And Shea templates are the, the common way to create new, new Scala projects. And it basically tells a little bit of, about Nix and, and it, how, how it could be useful for Scala projects. Um, all the users, all, all they need to do is basically run this command and it, they will have a project with, um, <clears throat> with an opinionated uh, Nix uh, setup so they can actually build the project using SPT derivation as well as creating Docker images. And, and they have all the setup for running on GitHub Actions using Nix and Kashyx as well. Um, so I'm out of time, but you, know, um, you can try this out at home if you're interested. And um, yeah, thank you all for listening. And um, yep. I'll be taking um, any questions. Yeah, you have um, one question that I can give to you right now, if that's OK? Yeah. OK, so from Lambda Duck on IRC, it says, how do you build Docker images from Mac machines, if you do? From Mac machines, from Darwin, I mean. I believe that's what the question is about. Mac OS. Uh, well, I don't know. I never used Mac in my life, and I will never do. Uh, oh, OK, OK. But um, yeah, we used Linux, uh, uh, and and we build the Docker images in, um, in the CI build. Uh, but uh, I think it, it should work in, on on Mac OS too. But I don't know. I will need to check with my with my colleagues to see how they do it. <laughs> but I guess they just run Nix build as well as the same way I do it. Right. Right. Okay. I don't see any more questions. Wait. Okay. Then I'll stop sharing. We have. I think we might have one more question. So, what was the most surprising part of introducing Nix? into your infrastructure. I think we have time for one more question at work. Uh, I'm sorry, your, your audio just went away. Can, could you repeat the question? Yeah, OK. So what was the most surprising part of introducing Nix at work? If you can answer that question. 
Um, the most surprising part of introducing Nix. Um, so now I'd say, um, well, I don't know if surprising. It wasn't really surprising to me because I was already using Nix for my open source projects. Uh, um, um, then what, rather, what um, surprised your coworkers the most, maybe? Um, I, I think like there was no surprise. Like I, everybody liked it, and I think you only need one person to take the lead on and actually and you know promote the usage. And if everybody uh, is happy with it, then that's it. But yeah, they were. I think don't think anybody was surprised. I think. Oh my gosh, were... you're incredibly lucky. Other people have a um, much much harder time. <laughs> yeah, I believe so. Yeah, um, as I said before, like when you when you introduce uh, something that is functional, which uh, uh, promotes reproducibility and immutability to a group of functional programmers, I don't think there is a huge surprise because we are used to write functional programming, uh, and we know the benefits. So I think it, it actually fits in pretty pretty much. Right. Not if it were well. like um to like people who work with Python, it would have been a different situation. I think that that would be yeah a, a, a big shock. Uh, like at least there would be a bigger surprise. But yeah, mm -hmm. I, it I, could be I, like I, the first functional programming language for some people. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't know. Yeah, I, okay. I don't have experience with uh, other languages that are not functional. <laughs> okay, I think that um, I think we're out of time. So thank you so much for um being um available early since our other speaker um, wasn't able to make it. You really did save us being able to do that. So we had to like uh, cut to a 25 minute break or something. Uh, no worries, thanks. And and sorry for not checking the, the chat. I, I was actually really lost. I was just talking, looking at the slides. And oh, your I, slides in your presentation was great. So I think you doing that has helped you focus. It's okay. Okay, I'll, I'll share the slides anyway on, on, on Discord and on Twitter. So. Yeah. Yep. I will also tell you about the breakout rooms is that um, you might have heard before we're going to <laughs> force you into them. So your room key for your breakout room, if there's any like discussion, if there isn't, I guess you can just like leave is just chat roulette at this instance. Oh, okay. Okay. No worries. Well, thank you very much uh, for, for organizing this. <laughs> I know it's not easy. Yep. It definitely isn't, but it's very um, rewarding. <laughs> okay. okay. With